Hello everyone and welcome to a bonus discussion. Uh, today I'll be talking about APA. Uh, it's relevant in that the submissions uh, that you're to be turning in in this program are intended to be using the APA style and in particular APA 7th. So it makes sense that maybe we should talk about it because without some foundational uh, information it's kind of hard to get it right. So that's the purpose of this discussion is to kind of dig into what it means to understand it is a thing, it is a thing unto itself, it is a non-trivial thing, uh, but uh, it is something that obviously can be mastered. So jumping straight in, kind of what is it, right? Um, and it's a fair question to ask of anything is where does this fit into the grand scheme of things? The basic idea is that it, it, is, it came from the world of psychology, that's what it stands for, uh, the American Psychological Association uh, Style Guides is what it is. And the, the reason that it is used is that there is benefit uh, to having things consistently formatted in a certain way. One of the things you'll probably feel as soon as you take a look at the style is that it's not really very pretty. And part of the reason for that is it's not necessarily meant to be consumed as it is. In this case, we do, uh, but it is primarily uh, intended, uh, whenever it's first created at least, as a means of submitting manuscripts for publication. And because of that, you need them in a certain format so that you can then transform them as need be into another format for actual publication. So that's part of the purpose of it. It also goes beyond simply what it looks like. It moves on to how you do certain things, how you talk about uh, numbers, for example, as a data scientist, that's very relevant. Uh, but also the tenses that you use when you're talking about people, the way that you describe groups of people as well, the type of uh, the tone, uh, the way things should be said. It's intended to be uh, dispassionate in that you convey the information without necessarily adding a whole bunch of your uh, opinions, because frankly, opinions have no place in scholarly writing. And that is in particular true whenever you're doing something that is quantitative in nature, such as data science. So the place to start is within the university's uh, online library. So we'll start a step back from what I showed you there. If you go to guides.rasmussen.edu slash library, uh, you'll end up on the online library. And centered uh, in the little tag cloud here is APA. Other ways to get there, but we'll start by doing it. And whenever you click on that, it opens up a new window. Uh, and in particular, it's a similar sort of URL, but the difference is that it ends in uh, APA. So uh, guides.rasmussen.edu slash APA. And I'll go ahead and make this a little bigger so that you can see it a little easier. There's a nice little toolkit here, right? And that's something that's relevant to note. And in particular, the thing that'll make your life a whole lot easier is the word template, which is located down here. Rasmussen chose to go with the student version of the APA 7th edition uh, and even for graduate level work, which is, uh, is the, the decision of the organization to make. Uh, some other organizations have made different decisions. Uh, there's a variation of it called a professional uh, version of the APA template, which some organizations adopt. Uh, the, the differences are pretty subtle between the two, primarily limited to the, the headers on each page and the title page. Beyond that, very little difference, uh, if any, between them. But you definitely do want the, to use the template. The template will make your life much easier pretty much in any submission where you're required to turn things in in an APA format. Some of the sub submissions in this course are pretty much source code, right? So it doesn't necessarily make sense to have source code formatted in APA format. Also, sometimes you'll have some submissions that are memos. Within uh, APA, there's not really a concept of a memo. Uh, that being said, you can still utilize the APA citation format, which is what a lot of people think APA stands for. But it's actually much broader than that, and that's what we'll be talking about today is what that means. So if you haven't already done so, you do want to probably download the APA uh, template, save it off somewhere, and at very least save this bookmark uh, so that you can later find it when you need it. So returning to what what is it, right? So what does it look like and why do you want to use it? So it's what it looks like. Not necessarily really pretty, right? I mean, there's there's not a lot of, uh, of style here. The only real style that you have is the, the title of the paper should be bold. Do make the title descriptive of what it, it is about, not uh, assignment three. Uh, that's not a very descriptive title. The title be, should be such that if a person were to stumble upon this paper, that they could understand what it's about. So think about it in terms of if you were creating a blog post, for example, then what would you name that blog post that would be concise, short, 
and descriptive of what the content of the, of the material is. And that's, that's definitely what you should be doing whenever you're creating a title. Uh, you also have uh, basically after the title and the title should be fairly short, should be title cased as the title example here is, which by the way is also a very poor title, title of papers, not a very compelling title, right? Uh, then after that, there's a blank line, then you, the name of the student, your name, and then your the organization which you're affiliated with. In this case, it's Rasmussen University. I need to change my slide because we're now Rasmussen University. Also, then you have the course number uh, and then the course title spelt out. So the course number uh, with whatever letters and so on that go with it. Uh, then after that, you have the professor's name, including their title. So in that, my case, it would be Dr. Alan Dennis. Then you have the date that the assignment is due. And that is what goes on your title page. There's nothing up here at the top. Uh, in the, um, uh, the the header in APA Professional over this part, uh, there would be a, a running head, which would be an all uppercase shortened version of the title of the paper. Uh, professional uses that, student does not. In this case, you don't need to use it. So then the next thing is, well, what's the first con uh, page of content actually look like? And in this case, it is a repeat of the title is the first thing that you probably will notice. The title that is on the title page also repeats onto the first uh, section of the paper uh, in bold and centered. Uh, beneath it, the first paragraph is assumed to be the introduction. You do not use the heading introduction because we as readers of things that are written in APA understand that the first paragraph on the, the first page of content or the first section even if there's more than one is intended to be the introduction so we know that that's where it is you don't need to tell the reader that that's what it is also nothing up here on the header uh, other than the page number and the page number is going to be there if you use the template for you so another reason that you might want to use it then the next thing you'll see is what references look like and there's a format that those references need to follow uh, and it's very particular uh, depending upon the type of, of publication that it is being published in, uh, it, there's a certain format you follow. Uh, one way of doing that is to do it yourself by hand in a hard-coded way. That's kind of hard. Um, an easier way, uh, whenever you have multiple sources and a lot of them, is, is to utilize a tool such as Zotero or EndNote, which are a reference tracking and research uh, organization tool. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. So uh, the next thing to talk about is an abstract. You may see some templates that have abstracts. Uh, generally speaking, ask an instructor before going to the trouble of creating an abstract because oftentimes it's both challenging to do and not necessarily applicable to the type of work uh, that we do uh, in some of these courses. Uh, but it, it may be. If it is, it's perfectly fine to do it. If you do it, uh, then there is a, a maximum length that it can be done. I think it's like 250 words. Look that up. Don't trust me. Uh, but it should also be a single paragraph. There is no indentation. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's a single paragraph with uh, no indentation. That's the key thing to understand. Uh, ask before you do it because it's probably not going to be needed. So whenever we're talking about writing scholarly papers, there's a, a pattern that emerges that I want to, to share with you. And if you follow this pattern, you're going to be pretty successful with your writing. Uh, it's somewhat mechanical in nature. Uh, th there is room for creativity, but it does help you uh, when you think about it from these terms. And the basic concept is that there is, generally speaking, an introduction, there is some content, and a conclusion. That's the basic idea of, of how it, 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 it works. Uh, this is true at various levels. So it is true whenever you're talking about a paper as a whole. The first paragraph, first section, uh, if it's if it's a relatively complex topic within a paper uh, should be the introduction it should introduce the the point of the the paper it should include things like thesis statements and subtopics and we'll talk about that in a moment uh, but it uh, it should always be there and it's also within that next you get the content which is the whole point of the paper right the body of the paper and then lastly every paper you write should have a conclusion a conclusion mirrors the introduction it restates the thesis statement generally speaking from a past tense but that's a style sort of thing but you basically in the conclusion remind the reader of what was the thesis statement and what did you talk about that addressed that thesis statement and and, and supported the claims if you made any during uh, the paper 
Uh, and also a key concept here is that generally speaking, you don't want to introduce anything new in the thesis or in the conclusion. What that means is that you likely will not have any citations in your conclusion. Rather, what you'll be doing is restating the things that you previously stated, oftentimes in past tense, not necessarily, uh, but basically uh, demonstrating that you did what you set out to do. Uh, this is also a recursive pattern. It applies to paragraphs and even to some extent it, it applies uh, to uh, sections of a paper as well and uh, arguably maybe even down all the way to a sentence but we won't probably go that far. So the the basic idea is first of all you, you start whenever you're doing any paper the whole first thing you need to think about is what is the thesis statement. It sounds like a fancy word right thesis statement but it's really not all that complicated. It's simply what's the point? Why are you writing this thing? Right. Um, and if you don't have a thesis statement that is pretty solid, pretty concise and pretty well worded, it's going to be very hard to be successful with your paper. Uh, oftentimes, especially whenever you're a student, your thesis statement is a, essentially a restatement of the assignment. Uh, and sometimes you give the reader uh, a hint that it is the thesis statement by saying something like this paper addresses the and then you say whatever it is that the point is. Right. Uh, it also Without it, it's really challenging to basically organize the structure of the paper, know what the point of the paper is, and know that you successfully communicated everything you're supposed to do. After you state the thesis statement, generally the next thing you want to do is talk about the things that you're going to talk about in the order you're going to talk about them that address that thesis statement. This is essentially most likely going to be your high level uh, headings, your, your heading level ones in the paper. Uh, may even go a little more deep than that, but that's the basic idea. And then generally, I, the last thing I typically do in my introductory uh, paragraph is uh, come up with the, the, the uh, list of things that are going to be there after the thesis statement and then uh, indicate that there will be a, con a conclusion or the conclusion will follow at the very end. And those are the basic pieces to do it. If you have that scaffolding in place, that, that foundational framework, then it becomes a simple matter of basically filling in the blanks. You, you know the point of the paper, uh, you have introduced it into your introduction, you may want to, part of the first thing that you might do as one of your subtopics is a bit of a, a discussion of the domain perhaps, if it's a, a particular area that it's addressing. And then you talk about the, the various things that address that thesis statement. Uh, oftentimes those are uh, rubric items, uh, so that makes it pretty straightforward in a lot of research papers. And then you wrap it up with a conclusion. So uh, the, the key thing is also to start with the topic, the thesis statement. So when you're doing an assignment, make sure you capture all of the elements of the assignment. That means taking a look at both the instructions and the rubric. Some, some instructors and some courses that you may see along the way may not necessarily include everything that is in the rubric in the assignment. They should, but there are instances where they do not. And in those instances, you're still going to be graded off the rubric. So do look at it. It's way of thinking of it is it's kind of part of the uh, instructions, right? And, and in, in particular, it is telling you this is how you're going to be graded. It's the decoder ring of your grade. So you, you definitely want to spend some time looking at it. That's the first thing you should probably take a look at after having read the instructions. So the, the key thing is to first make sure that you address all the points of the assignment. Oftentimes I create myself a, a rough outline uh, of those requirements, which are essentially my heading level ones, right? Uh, the subtopics that I'm going to talk about. Sometimes I'll put it in outline form. Sometimes I'll just make them heading level ones in the paper. It's entirely up to you. It depends upon the size of the paper to some extent, how complex it is. You do always want to have an introductory section or paragraph. And the reason I say section or paragraph is because sometimes you need to establish the, the relevance before you move on to talking about the thesis statement. So you may need to give the reader an indication of the domain which you're talking about. So what is this, the landscape that this paper should be read in? You know, the, the way of making sense of it and understanding what's the point in the context of this particular assignment. Always include a conclusion, as I said before. Uh, it wraps it up. It, it concludes the conversation. So think of it as you're on the telephone with someone having a conversation. Generally, you start with, hey, how you doing? So you have an introduction. Then you talk about whatever it is that you're talking about, if there is a particular point. So if you're especially doing business and you're making a call to do something, you'll start with typically a greeting. You then talk about what it is that you're wanting to accomplish or have done. 
and then you wrap it up with some niceties and you you say goodbye and perhaps wish somebody a nice day so that's essentially you may even restate the things that you want them to do so just as a, a, a to ensure that everybody's on the same page that's exactly what a conclusion is about if you don't include the conclusion it's kind of like hanging up on somebody right so you're in the middle of a conversation things are flowing it's pretty pretty nice rhythm going on and then it stops and it's really jarring to the reader so always wrap it up it's a really simple thing to write uh, and it makes a world of difference in your papers if you make a claim uh, that is outside of something that you're deducing as part of your, your original research so if you're doing something where you're doing some quantitative work or something or maybe you did a survey later on and you have some results and you're presenting them you don't necessarily need to cite that because that's something you came up with that is new but if you make a claim that is based upon some evidence and that evidence is maybe not necessarily all that obvious or certainly something that how how do you know that right that's the question that you're answering then make sure you put a citation you cite it on the first use of the source not at the end of the paragraph which i see from time to time uh, but it's on the first use within a, a particular paragraph generally speaking you only need to cite it one time within a paragraph there's an exception to that and that ex exception is if you have more than one source in a paper or in a paragraph and it's confusing as to who to attribute what to right so the point of a citation is to make it clear that this information came from this source if it's uh, one paragraph is all coming from one source uh, then it's it's there's no point of having multiple citations and if you do include multiple citations to the same source that's called over citation and it's actually discouraged in APA 7th uh, and so again you only do it whenever you're switching sources so let's take an example this isn't the most riveting thing but imagine that you're taking a course where you need to talk about IT security policy so you're asked to write three to four hundred words on IT security policy implementations you, you're asked to define the concepts and the major elements uh, describe why it's important so why should they care uh, and also talk a bit about the challenges it may be faced during implementation and you're supposed to have at least three scholarly sources uh, and three to four hundred words with three scholarly sources eh, you might actually want more than that depending upon how you write so an example of a thesis statement is IT security policy implementations will be defined and explored including challenges faced during adoption not the most riveting thing you're ever going to read but it is a reasonable s statement of what is the point of the paper the basic outline is going to have your introduction uh, the definition of major elements importance challenges faced during implementation and then the conclusion and then somewhere through here you start thinking about a title uh, note that introduction does not map over to a heading everything else may very well uh, title casing the challenges faced during implementation so here's what uh, it might look like right so uh, this is the the again the student page uh, with a, an overview of information sec uh, technology security implementation not the most riveting title but it kind of gets the point across and notice it's not assignment five or something right so it, it clearly denotes it the name of the student uh, the the name of the university the course code and title my name and then a date uh, that the assignment is due and then title uh, or no running head in the upper left hand corner and a page number goes in the upper right hand corner one thing to understand about within that page itself is uh, the, the, the title uh, is on the first page of the content. It repeats again. We'll see that in a moment. Uh, generally speaking, everything is left justified. Uh, the, every paragraph starts with an indentation. And you'll see there where in the right side of the screen where it says uh, indentation and special is on first line so basically every line on a new paragraph is indented by half an inch that is the the way that everything should be also everything should be double spaced uh, that is pretty much true of everything inside of APA pages uh, papers uh, the first section is going to be the introduction you don't use the introduction heading again so here's what it might look like whenever you start translating your outline to the actual stub of your paper I generally do this sort of thing myself whenever I'm writing papers. I'll, I'll go ahead and put the headings in and I'll make notes to myself in a way that I'm unlikely to forget to remove them. So I usually put it in brackets or something. Sometimes I'll highlight stuff uh, with uh, like a yellow highlight. Uh, it can be kind of ugly at times, so it, it depends on what works for you. So once you've kind of got the stub of things together, then you're prepared to actually kind of start doing the paper, right? It starts by doing some research. Uh, you're going to want to use either the university's library or scholar.google.com pretty good resource as well 
And then it's all about coming up with what are the magic search terms that find the things that you're interested in. Here are some examples for this particular topic. Generally speaking, you want things that are less than five years old. As with all things, there are exceptions to the rule. In particular, when it comes down to something called a seminal work. What that means is that there is somebody that came up with an idea the first time. And they may have done so in more than five years ago. So in that situation, it's perfectly acceptable to cite them. Uh, if you talk about something like a Belmont report, which is something you may face in future courses whenever you're doing your own research as you pursue higher degrees beyond your master's, uh, you may want to talk about the Belmont report. You could do something where you cite somebody that talked about the Belmont report, or you could cite the Belmont report directly, going to the seminal work and doing your own thought and your own analysis on it. That's a key concept to understand with citations as well, and sometimes it's kind of glossed over. You should only cite something in a paper that is new to that author's work. You shouldn't be citing things out of like their literature review where they're talking about what somebody else said. Rather, you should be talking about stuff that is related to the things that they learned during their work. Now, if they came up with some argument by piecing together other research and came up with some logical conclusion based upon nothing more than a literature review, that may be still okay but make sure you're citing the stuff that is in either their discussion or their um, uh, essentially the, the pieces that is talking about their findings, the pieces that are unique to that work, not something that's in the literature review where they're citing somebody else. That's called a secondary citation, not a great thing to do. So basically you kind of repeat this basic process of finding a source in the library, uh, whatever one you're using, Generally speaking, you want to start by kind of skimming over the abstract and in particular looking for what was the point of the paper and what were the findings. Uh, and then the next thing is to kind of oftentimes jump down to the conclusion. Then you may jump back to the introduction. Very rarely do you ever read a scholarly paper from start to finish. Uh, generally, you're, you're jumping around to the pieces that are of interesting, in particular things like findings or perhaps discussion where they talk about what came out of their research. Uh, and then how do you know if it's a good source or not? That's a reasonable thing of knowing what is good look like. Uh, and those are, it's, it's kind of a skill that you learn over time. You look for where was it published at? If it's published in a fairly reputable journal, that's one thing. If it's published in Bob's, you know, uh, fly by night first issue journal that isn't necessarily all that well, you know, uh, well known, then maybe don't want to use that one. What are the uh, institutions are the authors associated with? There's a difference if they're from some community college in some small part of the world versus from Harvard or Yale or, or some prestigious university that's in a particular field, maybe Carnegie Mellon or Berkeley. Uh, so, and again, though, that's subjective because if it's Berkeley and it's something like English literature may not be as good as some other smaller school perhaps in that field. So you have to do it based upon kind of the, the schools that are known for certain things and so on. Uh, it's kind of a secondary thing, but you often want to consider it. Then you start looking through, does, does it seem like what they did in their research made sense? Was it the methodology solid? Is it well written? Uh, is it easy to find things like the thesis statement and the, the research and their findings? If you start seeing things like typos, you probably want to skip on past it. And there's a, a reason for it that it's not just about being a snobbery snob about English, right? It's it's about probably the paper didn't actually go through a proper peer review. Uh, peer review is whenever people that are skilled in the art take a look at a, a potential publication and provide feedback on it to decide if it's worthy of publication or not. So generally speaking, if something hasn't been through a proper proper peer review, you don't really want to look at it. Moving on to things like paragraphs. So when you're writing a paragraph, it follows that same pattern we talked about at the beginning. The first sentence should be uh, the, the point of, of the paragraph. It's called the topic sentence. The reader should be able to read the first paragraph of, or first sentence of every paragraph and have a pretty good idea of what it is you're saying in your paper. So it's not a mystery novel whenever you're writing this style. It's very uh, concise, very clear, and you make it to where it's easy for the reader to understand. Uh, you may or may not have a citation on the first sentence. Uh, and some argue that you should not because what you're introducing in that first sentence is the concept, the, the point of that paragraph, the topic. What are you going to talk about? What claim are you making? And so on. And then generally speaking, you should follow it up with evidence after that initial uh, sentence. 
So if you're doing that pattern, then there wouldn't be a citation on the first sentence. However, sometimes you may actually introduce a claim. So if you say there are 5 million deaths of widgets every year, how, how do you know it's 5 million, right? So in that kind of situation, you might want to lead with a, a sentence that is uh, to get the reader's attention uh, that does require citation. Um, and as I said, it's basically introduced in the paragraph. You want to support the position or the claims that you're making with subsequent sentences with using one or more uh, citation, depending upon how you're writing and at what level of detail we're going into. And then the very last thing you write within a paragraph should stitch it together, it should pull the concepts together, essentially conclude uh, the paragraph and then move you into the next paragraph. So it, it's kind of a weaving that you do of wrapping up what you were saying and ideally preparing the reader for the next paragraph. And you basically repeat that process over and over. So why do you care about paragraphs, right? And basically they are the building blocks. They are the heart of the paper. Uh, obviously paragraphs are made up of sentences. Sentences sometimes have citations. Uh, but it, it's also a way of thinking of sometimes it's easier to write five to ten paragraphs than it is to write 10,000 words or, or sorry, a thousand words, which are roughly the same thing. So sometimes breaking it down into more manageable chunks makes it easier to understand. Plus, it's a way of organizing your thoughts into a concise way. Uh, a paragraph should have a single thought. I occasionally see papers with students th that the paragraph is like a page and a half to two pages long. That tells me that it is, there can't be one thought that takes that long to express. Generally speaking, a paragraph's around maybe five sentences or so. At very least, it's typically three. That doesn't say it has to be three. And the reason you say three is introduction, some evidence, and then the conclusion, right? So topic sentence, something that supports the topic sentence, and then something that wraps up what it is you've said. That's why you get to three, but per APA, you can actually have a one sentence paragraph and you would do so if you're wanting to make a very strong and a compelling statement, a very compelling argument uh, for what something should be. So when we talk about sentences, there's some rules, right? So it's all about clarity and precision, being very concise as to who it is that is doing something. Generally speaking, you don't say they or this, because if you say this or they, you need to probably say who this or they is, right? So. Uh, or are. So this idea or this phenomena uh, is a way that you might uh, might do that. It's not saying you don't just use those words, but it needs to be very clear as to who the, the receiver of that action or that, that word is. You don't use contractions, write everything out. So do not use contractions. That's the way to think of that. Uh, and a, sen a sentence should basically be a single thought, a paragraph, a single idea. Uh, that is reinforced by a series of single thoughts. And generally speaking, you want to use Grammarly. Uh, Grammarly is a nice tool that goes through and, and helps you become a better writer over time by essentially training you uh, with the things that you need to not do. So do consider using uh, Grammarly. Each paragraph should contain a single idea, have three to five sentences, as I just mentioned, three being introduction or topic sentence, uh, something that supports it in a, a conclusion. Generally speaking, there's going to be at least one citation with some exceptions. Perhaps your introduction may not have one, nor your conclusion. Uh, and then you may want to use the meal plan. So what's the meal plan, you ask? Uh, this comes from Duke. Uh, the idea is that an, a, uh, a paragraph should have a main idea, then you present, present some evidence, followed by some analysis, and then you lead out to the next paragraph. So the main idea uh, is it's the point of uh, the paragraph. So it is the topic sentence. Uh, you're not writing a mystery. You're being very concise as much as you can be. It should be very easy to tell what the point of a paragraph is. Uh, and it, uh, it should uh, also ideally show how that idea relates to other ideas. Whenever you're doing evidence and analysis, you need to support it typically with some sort of a claim uh, that you're making with a citation. You also uh, need to show how it fits together. So it's a synthesis thing that you're doing. Uh, and generally speaking, evidence does require a citation. Analysis uh, is it's not your opinion. Uh, it is showing how logically the evidence relates to the claim. Uh, so it's not a, an opinion piece. And your opinion may have value, but it has no value in scholarly writing. 
your unless your <laughs> opinion is supported by evidence and analysis uh, and that's a, a very specific way of writing then lastly you want to link things together and then lead out so you tie the topic that you just talked about to the the bigger topic uh, of the paper and then you uh, show how what you've presented wraps the, you know kind of all supports it and then you ideally prepare the reader for the next section uh, that they're going to be reading so if either the next paragraph in the same section or something that transitions out whenever you're looking at uh, how how do I know I did well right so what's the success success criteria of a of a paragraph so can you tell at a glance what's the point is there evidence that's supporting any claim was the evidence analyzed in such a way that it, it shows thoughtful consideration and can you tell what's coming next based upon when the paragraph kind of wrapped up and those are kind of the key concepts to do what you don't want to do uh, and I don't see this as often in most uh, places like this in Rasmussen but you don't want to copy a paragraph from a source uh, and then go and do some word synonyms thinking that you're uh, gonna uh, bypass plagiarism tools uh, forget to put the citation on there uh, and then basically claim somebody else's work as your own uh, so an example of what to do from Wikipedia uh, and by the way Wikipedia is not a <laughs> scholarly source but it's serving a point here so plagiarism is the wrongful appropriation and stealing and publication of another's language thoughts ideas or expressions and the representation of them as one's own original work now think about what that means for just a moment before we move on it's not just the words it's somebody's ideas uh, uh, and thoughts so keep in mind that if somebody had an idea and you don't attribute that idea to them uh, then you may have just completely you know uh, done plagiarism so make sure you're citing ideas as well as actual words so if you were to go through and replace some things with word synonym replacement uh, plagiarism is the wrongful adoption uh, that might be okay and theft and book that's probably not going to work uh, because you can tell that that's not really what it was meant to do of another writer's language views thoughts or words uh, that you might get through that and the depiction of them as one's own uh, one's personal unique work whenever you do send an replacement not something that I see much here uh, but it, it's really you can tell right it doesn't read well and somebody's trying to read it oftentimes it's it makes sense that it is uh, what happened right so it's a pretty good clear uh, and the reason reason not to do this is the reader is going to notice because it's going to be really jarring it's basically academic dishonesty and theft uh, it's not acceptable at pretty much any level of, of college let alone graduate school it's not your thought uh, and worse yet it's probably going to cause you to fail uh, not something that comes up as I mentioned here but it, it can uh, come along uh, some paragraph resources that you may want to consider Duke's writing lab is pretty good as is Walden's a few tips and hints uh, reference management generally speaking you don't want to do it by by hand you may want to use EndNote it's a great tool but it's not free Zotero is a free alternative that was created uh, I believe out of George Mason University to kind of be a per, per free alternative to EndNote because EndNote is a great tool not cheap uh, you can also use words reference feature but it's pretty limited and I don't think they've adapted it to APA 7th yet uh, but if you use Zotero or EndNote they both integrate into Word uh, they both import uh, files known as RIS or EndNote files uh, and they allow you to make notes flag articles rate articles and so on uh, so definitely uh, something worth looking into especially if you pursue uh, things that involve a lot of research and a lot of writing uh, use a word template it makes your life easier uh, it basically has you could do it all yourself you could do the same thing that a word template does for you uh, but it gives you a nice starting place to start off with uh, and so you, you definitely want to consider using it as I mentioned at the beginning you can get it at the the guides Rasmussen edu slash APA and download it here's uh, an example of pulling in a file related to our earlier example of using a security uh, thing and if you whenever you go into Google Scholar you click on the little double quotes uh, and it'll pop up so you you click on the double quotes you pop up it'll pop up this window you click on uh, EndNote uh, and uh, then you download a file that you can then pull into uh, uh, your whatever resource tracking thing you're doing whenever you're reviewing those uh, publications you take a look at the abstract you take a look at the findings conclusions if everything's still looking good uh, then you keep going and you only cite what is new in that article not something that they're citing from someplace else 
Uh, here's an example of a review of an article. I'm taking a look at the abstract. I've highlighted something out of the introduction, primarily because it's on the same page. And they're clearly stating the goal of the paper. And the abstract uh, includes a, a pretty easy to find uh, a thesis statement, including uh, kind of what's the point. This paper, that gives you a real clue. Whatever comes after that probably is the point of the paper, right? And that's probably the thesis statement. Also, then jump down to the, the conclusion. Generally speaking, uh, it, uh, it restates uh, the point of the paper uh, and oftentimes adds a few more uh, takeaways. Also notice you're not seeing a whole lot of citations in there either because it should be wrapping things up. This is an example of producing a paragraph from that, that resource I just showed you. Note that it, it's, and this isn't my best work by any, any means, but I'm citing on the first sentence because um, I'm making a claim that one could argue I shouldn't know outside of that paper. Uh, and then I'm moving on to the talking about it, and then ideally uh, I'm trying to prepare the reader for what's going to come next, right? Uh, some kind of concepts to keep in mind. Make notes to yourself whenever you're doing the writing. Make sure you define any acronym before you use them. Uh, cite, generally speaking, on the first source, uh, first time you use a source, you don't put it at the very end of the paragraph. Generally, you want to avoid quotations, and if you do quotations, there's a certain way they have to be done. It's a specific thing, and it depends upon the amount of things that you're quoting. Uh, uh, the simplest is probably to avoid it unless you really need it. Uh, the, the rule is generally only use a quotation if there's no way to say it better yourself or as good as it said in that original, or you're wanting to make a compelling argument that is very well said with that quotation. The... The, the next thing is moving on to writing an introduction. Here I'm including my thesis statement, and then I talk through the things that I'm going to present in the order, including the conclusion at the last. Uh, and that's a, a reasonable sort of introduction. Not the most riveting thing, but it is good enough most of the time. Same thing with the conclusion. It mirrors the introduction that it talks about the thesis statement, but I generally shift to a past tense, so was presented uh, versus will be presented. And... Uh, uh, the statements of it either is either past tense or it is so uh, in current tense uh, tense uh, so with that I'll wrap this up uh, as always if you have any questions about this material or if there's something else you would like me to talk about let me know uh, that's what I'm here for uh, if you want me to revisit some of the modules perfectly happy to do so if there's a concept that you're struggling with or a, a problem or an error you're encountering let me know I'd love to help and with that, I'll wrap this up. Stay safe, and we'll speak again soon.